Miss Throba, please. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker and registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed to track and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither PhilStockWorlds.com, CSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of the respective offices. Personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, and registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involve risk. Visit the SEC website www.optionscaring.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. The SW provides education and training services developed to teach you to the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying a guarantee of any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on a specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss as you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. Oh, okay. Don't mind, I got on me, so I'll and let's move on. All right. Uh, let's see where we are in the futures. <clears throat> mm, okay. Uh, as you can see, I made uh, well, we have, we're up two thousand dollars on the Russell so far. We had a nice little thousand dollar drop here. There's ten points, so that was nice in the morning. And uh, but other than that, and that was you know like it, it's stuff like that. It's right in the morning post. I mean, we we talked about it yesterday and today, in fact. And I forgot what I said today specifically, but um, I think I actually just referenced Monday's post. I say that. Ah, I thought I referenced it. What? Oh, well, it's Monday. That's why. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. So I said, see yesterday's post. So I said, yet another chance to short the indexes out of line. See yesterday's post. And then we refer to yesterday's post when I did put up the things. And here were the lines at the time. Okay. Oh, actually, we were at 1330. We were at 1335. Yesterday was 1330. And today was 1335. So we were a bit higher this morning. Um, but it's, you know these lines don't change, or if you're higher, it's you know you don't need me to tell you this thing. If you in the morning we're looking at short stuff. I mean, where were we this morning? We were at 22. We were you know we were over 2200 here. We were at 1335 here. You know, so where's everybody lining up where things when things are opening? Let's take a look now at the. Um, Dow, YM, and what's the other one? NASDAQ. <laughs> I knew it was another index. Don't worry. The NASDAQ. All right. Anyway, <clears throat> so here we are. You can see where the volume spike is. That's the morning open. So we're at 22.1250. We're at 19.2. We're at 13.35. And we're at 4.880. So all you have to do, if we're if our bias is short, all you have to do is make your own lines and say, okay, those are nice even lines. Let's watch a base for start falling. Then we're going to short. Now, if you want to look at other things we were looking at at the time, what, what, now what was our premise? Our premise is that the dollar wouldn't be getting weaker, and it wasn't into the morning, right? It's been go it was going up nicely for a while. So our premise is the dollar wasn't getting any weaker. Oil was going to stop here. Here's oil. We didn't think oil was going to go much higher, so that was going to take away the catalyst that was driving the indexes up. 
Oh, oh, gasoline went flying. Look at that. There was that target was 145. We consolidated there, but now it flew up to 148, which we held on to those. <laughs> um, natural gas flies flew up there, too. The Nikkei's crazy. But anyway, so then we had a little drop-off, and I know I, I remember saying something, but I really don't remember what I said in the morning. Um, I know I said something about the S&G at that spot, though. Oh, I knew I said it somewhere. Okay, yeah. So at, at the open, I said oil stocks are jamming up the indexes, but there's an undercurrent of selling, so good shorts at 19.2, blah, 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 blah. So that's, I, just, I did exactly what I said you should do. I looked at the numbers where we were at the time, and I adjusted my numbers up to say these are my shorting spots. The Nikkei was no good because the dollar was rising, and that made it no good for short, even though it's really tempting, and it's still very tempting at 18.5 for short. Because that is high, as you can see. But look, we went, in fact, it's a good thing we didn't short it, right? Because here's when I was talking about it. And then we went all the way up from 18.5 to uh, 18.650. Even though our indexes were falling. Okay, because the Nikkei is super duper sensitive to the dollar. You never want to short the Nikkei if the dollar is rising. Um, meanwhile, and also, also don't forget, it's a whole different set of circumstances out there. You don't know what Kuroda is saying. He said something really, you know, Kuroda or Abe say something, the prime minister and the um, finance minister. If they say something really major, it'll come across the wires over here. But they say stuff all the time, and so do a hundred other ministers you've never heard of. They say politicians, they have a whole life just like we do. They've got people on TV talking, and they've got talk shows and pundits, and they've got financial news networks with people discussing the market, and they've got their own version of Kramer. It's like a whole other world, <laughs> except with Japanese people. You know, Americans really, Americans are the worst at this. They always tend to forget that. Like, every country has this stuff. We're not unique. We're not the only people in the world who analyze finances. We're not the only people who have talk shows and people discussing things. We are the only people who interview celebrities and politicians. This happens everywhere. So if you think that you're going to be on top of the Japanese market just because you're going to get a, you know what Kuroda or Abe said, you are really way off, okay? There are all the same undercurrents. Like, look at us. We have, we have all these Fed governors. Japan has Fed governors, too. They say stuff too. So you, you don't play the Japanese market the way we play the U.S. market. You have to play the broader macros in Japan because you don't know and you can't know what's really going to happen. And especially intraday, you have no idea what's moving the market. It could be good earnings from one of the companies. It could be some, some ministry gives an outlook. They could have their beige book. Have you ever read the Japanese beige book? No. Oh, in fact, our base books it too. Don't forget that. So always keep that in mind when you're looking at foreign indexes because, it, you know, we don't know why it went up exactly. We do know it generally will go up when the dollar goes up. And we do know the Nikkei tends to follow our indexes, but it certainly isn't today, is it? The Nikkei has a mind of its own. And do we know why? No, we don't really know why. But it could be anything. It's very dangerous to think you know what's going on here. That's why we didn't play it. It was too dangerous to play, and boom. Look what happened. All right? Very important things. You just don't, I mean, you can't, to me, being a TA person, looking at these charts and going, oh, it went up, so it's going to go down. That's bull. Here, in fact, here's uh, resistance, too. Blew right through it. Like what resistance? Going right up. Doesn't care. This is a ludicrous number for the NEK, but what can you do? It's going to do what it does. Now, as to um, the Russell, <sighs> Because the Dow wasn't coming down and the S&P was bouncing off of this line, I took, I took off my, my short form of Russell at 25. I put a stop and I stopped out at 25 when it came up. Um, it's below 25 now. I really, it will break my heart if it falls lower and I miss it. But if the Russell falls lower, I wouldn't chase the Russell. I would short the Dow because look how far the Dow has to fall if it starts pulling back. But the Dow is not going to pull back unless oil starts falling again. But the point is, it's, a, it's what they call the fresh horse, right? We, we had a nice huge drop on the Russell, even better drop on the NASDAQ, frankly. But we had a huge drop on the Russell, and now 
I'm expecting it to bounce back to 13.30 at least, maybe 13.35 again. Be happy to go back in with my shorts. But I'm watching all my indexes to see what happens. All right, so that's where we are on those. Ow, that's right. Um, <laughs> JW says, can you explain how you calculate your shorting lines and adjust? You do it daily. Uh, no, because I, as I said, I tend to, I mean, we have our big shorting lines. The big shorting lines are on the big chart, and those are easily calculated. We do them every day, or almost every day. Um, here they are. These, these lines, I believe they're from November of 2014. And you might say, oh, well, why don't we adjust them then? Well, because, it, because frankly, the valuations haven't changed really. Um, at this point, now that we're two years into it, I would argue maybe that we're 10% higher values for the S&P and, the, well, I guess for everything. I could, I could see bumping everything 10%, but the NYSC has never made it over the must-hold line. I really can't in good conscience change these numbers until the NYSC shows me it can at least get to the goddamn must-hold line. Keep sailing. And if the NYSC, which is everything, the NYSC is essentially all stocks, right? Um, it's the biggest index. It's got almost every stock in it. Uh, the Wilshire is bigger, but the, you know we don't track that. Um, but essentially, it's a broader index. It's hard to manipulate. That's why we like to look at it because it's got more. It doesn't weight out stocks. It's hard to like make the NYSC go up by manipulating a few stocks like they can with every other index and like they do with every other index. So to me, that's an honest version of where the market is. And the honest version of where the market is is right at our must hold line. Now, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a premium price on the 500 biggest companies with international, with the most international business and global exposure. Those companies might deserve a premium. The 30 Dow components, like the S&P, they're big, large cap. They also probably deserve a premium to an average stock. Okay, the Nasdaq, 100 tech companies, including Apple, and, and we call it the Apple DAC because Apple is like 10 percent of the entire, 15 percent almost of the entire thing. So. You know, does Apple deserve a premium to, the, to every other company? Of course it does. No question about that. Now, the Russell is, is just it's the small cap index. They don't really shouldn't have a premium except for the fact that the Russell does 70 plus percent of their business in the U.S. Not 70, more like 80 percent of their business in the U.S. And the U.S. has the strongest recovering economy. And that deserves a premium too. So there is a logic to everybody being higher than the NYSE. Okay, they're bigger, they're specific in areas that are, that are succeeding right now. So there is some reasons that the NYSE should. Well, that doesn't mean that the must hold line for the NYSE should move. Though I may, I I have to consider that, and I and I am looking at it because I always do at the end of the year. That's why these are from November, you know, from the end of. Uh, 2014. I always look at these real closely and try to think about the values and so on and so forth. But can I see the S&P going below 2035? Mm, not much. And, and frankly, if it got to 1850, I would be saying bye, bye, bye at 1850. And now 1850 is like 20% uh, below where we are now. But if we got back to 1850, I would be gung ho bullish. And that's not what a must hold line is. That's really what the minus 10% line is. Okay, my range, if we're in a, you know, the idea is to show what the 20% range is, and must hold means must hold if we're going to be bullish. But, but really, 1850 is the bottom of the, of, the, of the new range at this point. So we may have to make those adjustments. Um, it requires a little more consideration, but, but that's where I'm leaning. It's sort of saying, okay, I think the danger of falling below 1850 is test. And the danger of falling below 4,000 on the NASDAQ has passed. I don't think it's likely that's going to happen again. Okay, so all these numbers would be extremely surprising if they broke. And on the NYSE, 
9900 would be surprising, but obviously we're below 11,000. I just don't think we're going to go below 9900, which is below what you see here. It's, it's way down in the chart. Now let's look at the um, NYA. So here's 9900. See how it held up there so nicely back in um, the July crash? And here's, this is 98 line, but here's 9900. 90, so here's the July crash. And here's this one in the, in, the, in the winter. We only went below it, but came right back pretty quickly. Now, pretty quickly is two months below, but still, I mean, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Now, here, look at this, though. This is more important. See this? Held, held, and held. So that's a, that's a really, really solid support line. Something with it. Really bad would have to happen for us to fail up at that 9900 area. Something, you know, it's critically bad, something. I, and I don't, I don't see that really in the normal course of things. I don't think it's that likely. And, and look, you know, look, Trump's president, right? They're going to dismantle Obamacare probably as fast as humanly possible. Um, I, I, frankly, I think that's bad for the healthcare sector. I think it's less patients, but on the other hand, they get to jack up their prices. Um, I don't think it's going to fall that fast. So that would be your biggest negative, obviously, would be the healthcare sector. Um, It takes time before it becomes bad for people. So on the one hand, you have a couple of million people who are, who are unwillingly paying health care for themselves now, young people who probably say, I don't want to have health care, but I get fined if I don't do it, but I'm paying my money into this. <clears throat> that frees up spending money for a couple of million people now. You think, you think it's nothing, but it's a couple of million people who pay 100 bucks a month or so for health care. Okay, so that's 100 million something a month. Let's say 200 million, 300 million dollars a month is suddenly stimulus, right? So there won't be a, a big negative effect right away. What's going to happen though is, of course, I don't even know what's going to happen. <laughs> I can't even imagine you have all these people and you just take away their health care. It's just incredible. <laughs> I mean, you know, what happens when they start getting sick? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, and people are going to freak out when their health care costs go through the roof. Um, so that's, that's a negative, but it's a slow-burning negative. It's not something that's going to really kill us in the first three months of the year or even the first six months. Or it'll, be, it'll be a year or so before you even start noticing what's happening. You know, that's, that's the great thing about doing these kind of things. You know, when you cut programs and when you cut costs, you know, you can cut school to nothing. And it'll take you 20 years before you realize you've got a bunch of stupid kids and, you know, stupid 20-year-olds coming to the labor force. You don't have to educate them. You don't have to educate anybody. Let them run around and wet themselves all day long. What's the difference? I mean, you don't have to do anything with kids. Okay, the only thing is when, by the time they turn 20, you better figure out what to do with them. Unless, of course, you have the attitude that nobody deserves a handout, and then it doesn't matter. Okay, they, they can either work as cheap as an Asian, or not. That's the way is to it. Um, you know, that, that's, and basically that's what the, the corporate America attitude is. It's like, hey, my labor force is being educated in China. I don't give a crap about the American education system. It's like, I, unless, unless American schools are going to teach Chinese engineering, I don't have any use for an engineer in America. You know, we talk about, like, we don't have any engineers. Who cares? There's no one for an engineer to work with over here. There's nobody to supervise. There's no employees making anything. And those jobs aren't coming back. <laughs> if you guys think Trump's going to bring jobs back, oh, my God. You wait till you see how the jobs fly out of this country. But anyway, so it's, but all these are slow, long-term things. They're not going to hurt the market that badly. Okay, we're going to debt. We'll start a war or whatever. None of that, none of that stuff is going to hurt the market. I wonder who we will be at war with. That'll be fun. We should have a pool. How did you arrive at 2212 on the ES? What, this morning? I looked at it. 
<laughs> we were up here, and 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 I and I decided that that two two one five. We were we were right around two two. I think we were a bit over when I was talking about. And two two one five. I was like, well, two two one five breaks out. It'll be good. It's about halfway between. Well, it is halfway between twenty two ten and twenty two fifteen, and it's where we were at the time. That's why I called it. The same thing with the Nasdaq. We were at you know forty nine uh, forty eight uh, eighty or something like that. When I said it, um, I guess we were here. Now the Nasdaq has it went even higher. But yeah, I'm looking. I'm just calling where we were because I was. I'm really marking those spots at the time I said it. So, so yeah, don't take that as like I'm doing some big investigation. I'm just putting, I'm just writing down, I'm saying I'm calling a short here, and here's where everything is at the moment where I'm calling a short. So logically, if I call a short there, unless I see something in the news that tells me to change my mind, I stick with the premise that I want to be short. And therefore, if three of the four things are below, I want to short the fourth or the third and the fourth as they cross under. All right, but it's not a, those, those, are, those are very different than if I'm writing down 5% lines or putting in the rules or stuff like that. Bounce lines are different. That's not a bounce line. That's just a call to go short and a mark of where we are at the time. Are you still bearish on the way? Wait, wait, I'm getting confused. Um, can you cover Apple, please? Uh, Apple, good company. <laughs> I don't know what you want to say. Um, you know, I, I think there's nothing wrong with Apple. I think, I think by the way, there's a, every, everything's a rumor, of course, but it seems like they're going to go OLED on the next set of phones coming up this year. And, um, I mean, that's what people expected. But when you do that, it's going to allow them to put in features. Oh, and wireless charging is totally cool. What did I do? Ugh, gallery view. I hate the way they have it set up now. You used to understand if you change your view that it would change, you know, do it for that stuff. Now you have to put it in every time. Um, so, you know, at the moment, Apple's sort of stuck in this little channel between the 50-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. Uh, it wants to go higher, but it needs a good reason. Okay, so we've got, of course, the Apple events are somewhere between January and March is the Apple event, and there's earnings. And, uh, I mean, for God's sake, it's the greatest company in the history of the world. So that's my opinion of Apple. It's like, how, how could you not own this company? What, would be, what is the point of expecting to be on this planet two years from now and not having Apple stuck? That's, that's, that's how I feel about Apple. It's, 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 I, 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 words cannot describe how much better this company is than pretty much anything else you could possibly buy. If I had to own one stock, I would happily own Apple. It, wouldn't even, it really wouldn't even bother me. I would, I would frankly just have my entire portfolio in Apple, and I would play Apple every day, and I would be pretty happy about my retirement prospects. Something on dollars a month for health care. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I probably said a number that made no sense. Right? All right, well, there you go. Though. You're right. I mean, uh, what I say, 100 bucks is kind of silly, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm a little out of touch. I don't write those checks. Um, I uh, let's see. How much is it? I know. It's, I know the family. I don't know. I honestly don't. I don't know. I mean, I, for a single, I'm talking about the young single people who are forced to be honest. I mean, that's, uh, I was just guessing. But uh, two hundred, three hundred. I don't know how much could they make somebody pay. I know my family is like fifteen hundred a month or something like that. But that's you know a top notch plan. I think that's what it is anyway. <clears throat> Honestly, I don't know because we, we, we change so much. Um, but whatever, whatever the minimum plan is for, for young people, I mean, that's the ones that, those are the ones that people want to dump. Because, you know, people under 25 think they're invisible. You know, not people under 25, sorry, people under 30, they think they're pretty invincible and, and they'd rather not spend the money. They'd rather go drink and <laughs> they'd rather go do something unhealthy with the money than actually put it into a health care plan. Yeah, it was not actually fun, you know what I mean? <laughs> Obviously. I have to and I still think, I mean, horrifying thing. But, but, that's, but that's the point, though. I mean, this is the callous bullshit we get when the Republicans come in. All right? Now, sorry if you're, if you're a Republican, God bless you, but, but 
you know, when, when, how often do Democrats start wars? You know, so um, I, I honestly think that we'll end up with another one. I mean, it's, the, okay, it's great for the GDP. Who's the economy? Why not? Do we see the dollar actually go down? I mean, why do you think, why do you think that defense companies overwhelmingly donate to Republicans? If we're a war, it's a fact. Do we see the dollar actually go down on a, especially Trump, for God's sake. I mean, the guy, the guy threatens to start a war with everybody he talks to. Do we see the dollar uh, actually go down on a, on an Ed hike? I guess that means a Fed hike. Damn it, I wish there was a way to make that not move. All right, do, all right, so what did the dollar do last December? So we got dollar, and we have last December. And I think last December, though, the expectation was there would be more of a hike, and I think the language they used when they, when they, when they hiked was sort of like wishy-washy to the point where it seemed they were, they were being more dovish than anybody thought. Um, and so we did that, and then we got all the way to the next meeting, and then, the, then, then people were like, these guys are not hiking rates again. And, and all, the, all the boosting of the dollar that had come before that. So, you know, from, in 2015, we drifted along at 95. We had a rally. See, you have to put it in context, because we had this rally in expectation of a Fed hike from 95 to 100, right? Then they hiked, but it was a wimpy hike, and we dropped. Then we came back to the high, and then we dropped off, and people gave up, and we went back to what is basically what I consider the minimum value for the dollar is 95, and now we've blasted. Now, now there's another. We're back to having certainty of a rate hike, and we've blasted back. Also, the interesting thing is we have a certainty of a rate hike. This did not happen before. We thought all central banks would tighten. That's not what happened. Okay, all central banks, we were the only central banks that was even considering tightening. No other central banks are tightening. Now we're tightening for a fact, and there's not any other central bank in the world that's even mentioning tightening. In fact, uh, Carney was just, uh, Bank of England was just on today talking about how we, we're not freaking tightening nothing. So uh, what do you, let's see what he exactly said. Let's see what Simon Carney. I'm going to quote them out of context. Uh, November 30th, okay. Uh, more clarity how Britain intends to leave. It is preferable for as much as possible, uh, blah, 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 having clarity. Uh, anyway, well, he, he just, oh, I was uncertain. Okay, let's, No, he's not really saying anything here. Okay, anyway, the, so the gist of what he said, though, he said a lot of stuff. He had a whole conference. Um, the gist of what he said is that it's too uncertain. There's no chance that we, we want to raise rates given all this uncertainty. But that's, that's theoretically unique to, to the U.K. But, of course, Draghi's not raising rates either. Japan is, is, is trying to figure out how they can lower rates more below negative one. Um, uh, you know, uh, no, nobody in Europe is raising rates. Uh, a couple of, a couple of um, our peripheral countries have raised rates because their inflation is getting out of control. Um, but that's our fault because the dollar is so strong, their currency is weak, and inflation is going up. So they have to do something before the people start. So anyway, it's a mess. But this is, this is how the whole thing starts falling apart, though. Right now we have the divergent problem because now the dollar is so strong that we're forcing other people to act. And then as we force them to act, and other people are forced to act. And before you know it, all of a sudden, it's a complete mess. So we have that to look forward to. I didn't understand your CLX for explanation of saying you said they're over capacity, but you're wrong. Who's over capacity? We're long because of OPEC. We were long into this. I expected it to go up because we expected OPEC to do something. The fact of the matter is what they're doing isn't enough, and now we're back to being short at 50. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit. Trump administration war pool up <laughs> my membership fee. 
that we were war with Iran first. <laughs> that would be funny. Oh, poor Iran. I mean, they did, though, they really did work so hard to, to comply with all other men. That would be horrible if we started <laughs> with to that. So hang on for the OOP play for Apple. Oh, yeah, of course. No, I, I mean, we're not getting out of that. The option opportunity play. Um, here it is. What's that play? Um, do we even sell any calls? Oh, we did sell some calls. Look at that. Um, see, we were even conservative here. It's the 100, the 2019. So in, in two years, we think Apple will go from 110 to 130. So we think it will gain 10% a year for two years. Meanwhile, though, we sold $6,000 worth of calls. We'll roll them. So either Apple goes down and these calls expire worthless. Now, how much do we spend on the trade? We spent 78 minus 36 is 30, I don't know, 42? Yeah. 42. 42 minus 9 is um, 33. So we spent 33,000 on the long play. We sold 6,000, so we netted in for like 27,000 or 26,000, I guess, 26,250 exactly. So we ran this play at 26,250. We have these calls. Now, either these calls go worthless and we sell for more and, not, and, and drop our basis lower than 26,250, or they expire in the money and we roll them along, but if these are in the money, if the short 110 calls are in the money, then that means that, um, that, means that our, our trade is going well. Okay, because we're going to get 30, because first of all, we get $30,000 at 110. So we're profitable. We have a 2610 net. 26,250 net, and we get back $30,000 simply if Apple is at 110 or higher. And don't forget, we only sold 10 of these. So we're in no danger whatsoever here. And, and so if it goes lower, then we sell another 6,750, and we drop that basis from 26 to 20. And if it goes lower again, we sell another 6,750, and our basis goes from 20,000 even to 14,000. You see how that goes? So if Apple goes lower, who cares? If Apple goes higher, who cares? It's hard to care. It's, it's, a, it's a very nice trade, actually. And what's our net on this trade right now? We're actually showing a net loss, so it's even a good time to come in and get a trade like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't get those uh, Fed minutes. Uh, the, the beige book will take a look. Uh, young okay, yeah, but the young people under 26 are covered by parents on ACA unless they destroy the unless they delete the ACA. They want to just repeal it. They want to eliminate that. You know, Trump put in a guy whose whose whole thing in Congress has been talking about getting rid of the ACA. Um, do you play this Italy voting stuff at all? Um, it's, it's too weird. It's like, it's like, well, look, first of all, Trump got elected, we went down, then we went up. And Brexit came in, we went down, then we went up. So, you know, what, what's your play going to be? You know, if you have a ton of money and, you don't, and you're not going to get yourself stopped out by some massive move against you in the overnight, because no matter which way you, you're playing, whether you're right or wrong, you can easily get a massive move against you. Then, then fine. But I, I think on the whole, obviously, we're, we're just generally bearish about the Italy thing because I, I don't know which way that election is going to go, but I, I just think the tensions in Europe, is, if it's not Italy, it'll be somebody else. But someone else is leading the Europe, the, the EU. And then somebody else will leave the EU. And eventually everyone's going to leave the EU because it's a broken thing that doesn't work. And it might take, uh, it'll take a long time. I mean, look at the UK. They, they firmly voted to leave, and they're still there. Um, it'll take a long time. It's a big process, and it'll take years and years for the whole thing to, to finally fall apart. And, and don't forget, at some point, they're going to desperately try to do something to stop it from falling apart. And that'll work for three months, six months, a year. 
So you know, it's it, it's a, it's just such a long, slow process. It's really not worth you know putting too much energy into as far as the trade. But we'll just see what happens. But but certainly, it's one of the dominoes that can start pushing. And if, and if Italy does go that way, even if Italy does vote uh, to to um, I think what they're voting is, if I understand it correctly, they're voting to give more power to the states, essentially, and if they give more power to the little provinces, where they call themselves over there. So they're voting to give more power to the states, and by doing that, they're depowering the uh, the, head, the the prime minister. And if they depower, if they depower, um, he'll be kicked out. And if he's kicked out, then the people who come in are most likely going to be wanting to get out of the EU. And then they'll start a process to get themselves out of the EU. This, you know, we talk six months, a year. So nothing is going to actually happen other than a bunch of rhetoric either way. It, it, this isn't a referendum to leave the EU. This is just a referendum to change their government. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it helps the opt out to pay the penalty. But I'm saying there's certainly, uh, uh, certainly some million or so people that are in who said, well, I may as well have health care, you know, instead of paying a hundred instead of paying whatever it is to nothing, which I think might be the hundred dollars a month. But instead of paying a hundred dollars a month to nothing, I'll pay two hundred dollars a month and get health care. There's probably millions of people like that. Now those people, once there's no penalty, are are very possibly going to say, oh screw this, I'll take my money back, thanks. That's what I mean. Those young healthy people that the whole thing was never so properly. I mean, you need young, healthy people in a plant, just like Social Security. You need young workers to pay for the old workers. You can't have it optional. Obviously, when you're old, you say, yeah, I want a retirement plan. When you're young, you say, I don't need a retirement plan. <laughs> Once you're old and you haven't saved any money, then you want a retirement plan. Um, so if you let people opt into Social Security, it would, be ba it would be completely bankrupt. And that was the problem with Obamacare, too. You can't let anybody opt in or opt out. You have to have universal health care. Other countries do this. It's not, we're the only country not doing it. We're the, only, we're the only developed country not doing it. You can't make these things optional. Like, this is part of the cost of being a citizen. You pay your tax so that we run all the hospitals and pay all the doctors. And how many hospitals do we have? We have enough hospitals to take care of the, of the people. How many doctors do we have? We have enough doctors to take care of the people. It, it's not, uh, you know, being a doctor doesn't have to be, you know, and, and by the way, doctors, doctors in England and France, they have nice lives. It's a good job. They're not, they're not incredibly wealthy, but frankly, our doctors aren't either the way insurance is in this country. It's a good job. It's a solid living, and um, it's, a, it's a prestigious thing to be. There's, there's no shortage of doctors. People want to be doctors. People want to be nurses. It's a good job. Okay, their health care is just as good as that. I mean, frankly, rating-wise, everybody's health care is better than that. We have terrible ratings in our health care system. Um, and it's much cheaper. They spend half as much money as we do on health care because it's not run as a profit center. That's all. It's very simple. If you don't run it as a profit center, it doesn't cost as much money. It's the simplest thing on earth, and somehow they can't convey this concept to the people. It's amazing. I mean, obviously, there's a half the half of the the politicians won't, don't want to convey that to the people. They want to they want to confuse the people. But the reality is, it's very simple. Okay, if you take out the 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 hospitals that want to make a profit and the doctors that want to make a profit, and you take out the the uh, insurance companies that want to make a profit, and you take out the pill companies that want to make a profit, if you if you take away all the profit motivation for all those people and say, here's what healthcare is going to cost in this country, then you make it cheaper. And it's not a fantasy. This is how it works in every country but America. Is the, prob the, the problem with Obamacare is it didn't go far enough. The, fact, the problem is that he compromised. He never should have compromised. Putting in a compromised program is what killed it. And that's what the Republicans wanted, though. They wanted it to die. They wanted, to, they wanted a bad program so that they could pick at it until it, until it was completely dead again. And now they get to go, oh, see, that didn't work. <laughs> ah, I mean, chaos, I'm telling you. Because, we, because before Obamacare, we were having 20% plus annual increases in health care, and it was running out of control. And they go, oh, under Obamacare, we have these increases. Yeah, but you know what? It's, it's slowed dramatically. We go back to those 20% annual increases, and probably in 10 years, nobody in the country, nobody, nobody, in the, nobody in the bottom half of the country will even be able to afford health care. 
It's going to be something they can't even have. Uh, where are we? Cover blah, blah, blah. Cover the dollar. Next, please. Ah! Can you cover the dollar next year because it's talk of devaluation dollar maybe third? What? Well, I can't cover that because I don't see where that would happen. Why would that happen? Other countries have to start tightening their policies for the dollar to get weaker. I think the dollar is a bit high at 102, but until rates start normalizing elsewhere, and if we're hiking, if the Fed's going to hike now, and we hike again in March, why would the dollar go down if nobody else is hiking? That's, that's a, I, I don't know people look, just because somebody said something doesn't mean it's going to happen. People say all kinds of wrong things. <laughs> Global currency. Yeah, good luck with that. We are running out of Oh, yeah, we're running out of dollars because they're massively in demand. That's why, right, because it's the most demanded currency on Earth, and it's the biggest currency on Earth. So even though we have more dollars on the planet than any other currency by a mile, like two to three times more than euros, even though there's many more dollars in the world than there are anything else, there's still not enough. So we could print dollars, and probably we will. Probably Trump's administration will print dollars to pay debts. But still, it would take a lot of printing to devalue our money. It takes a lot of money printing. And it's not likely to happen. And, and also, his people are strong dollar people. The Trump administration people are generally strong dollar people. They think strong dollars are good. And uh, they're not likely to change much of that. So when you run it, you don't run out of dollars. Dollars just become more valuable. That's all. It costs more dollars to get something. Uh, I don't have the, you run out of dollars at this price, but then you have to say, okay, I'll pay more to get dollars, and all of a sudden they become available. Uh, I don't have the latest update on Apple where you have the 219 plays when that was posted. Well, it's right there. Apple. And it was sometime around 1019, 1021. Somewhere around there is when we, when we made any adjustments to that play. So it's probably our last review. So if you go to the virtual portfolios, that's top trades. And here's our September portfolio review. And where, which, which one was this in? We're talking about the options opportunity. Okay, so here's the options opportunity portfolio. And we go right here and we open it up. And we go down here. Oh, I didn't give it a chance to, to find itself. That was silly. That's my fault. Oh, 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 oh. And here's the OOP. What was I looking at there? Is that the long term portfolio? That's, wait a minute. My bad. Oh no, this is the OOP. Okay, so at some so at some point we changed it. Now I lost track. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is the OOP, and it was September. So I open it again and see what happened. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, I'm not logged in with Seeking Alpha. <laughs> A PSW member. There you go. This one. All right. Now I'm going to wait for it to properly. There it goes. Okay. <clears throat> so I imagine that here, Apple, 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 Apple. Is the Apple? Hmm. Okay. So sometime after. Oh, obviously, because the changes made this in October. So sometime after this, this one, we did the changes. I don't know when they're exactly in October. I guess what we've done, we must have done the portfolio review since then. I bet I just didn't post it. I, I think I just didn't post it to here. If anybody knows if we did an October portfolio review. But if not, I'll do a November one anyway. Speaking of November, it's like our anniversary for our portfolios, right? Because um, the long and short term, I think, are from November. So let's see. Short term portfolio. Wow. Wait, was that the OOP? 128% on the OOP? That's crazy. Oh, man. Okay. Wow. 
How are we this bullish? I swear I didn't mean to be this bullish. Um, so anyway, the short-term portfolio is right from November. There is November 26th, so this is exactly like our three-year anniversary. So we're up 378 percent in three years on the STP, and on the long-term portfolio, these were paired. They started the same day, November 26, 2013, and this one is up 131 percent. That is blasting. The butterfly started earlier. That's our oldest portfolio. And that was from um, July of 2013. That was up 221 percent. So they're all doing fantastically. I mean, and why shouldn't they be? I mean, look at the freaking market. I mean, they'd be sad. You know, actually, I'm sorry. I, I see all these hedge funds that are having terrible years. I'm like, what are they doing? What is, what is wrong with these people? It's like, if you can't make money in this kind of market, you got a real, real problem. <laughs> All right, so moving on from that. So anyway, so in chat, just uh, if you don't have the play, we'll find it for you in chat, but I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, and I have to hang on. Wait, we said that already. Didn't we about the Apple play? All right, no sound, blah, blah, blah. Can you please post the latest OOP? With, yeah, uh, <laughs> it will be done. Okay, hopefully this week. I mean, if you're an OOP member, the, the latest OOP portfolio, is, 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 it can't be more than like a week or so old, the one that's up there. Um, or, you see, in, in Seeking Alpha, if you're a member over there, it's up there. And if you're, if you're a PSW member, I know that like at least the week right before I left on vacation, before Thanksgiving, I, I put up a portfolio in the chat room. Um, but anyway, we'll do it again. Italy, all I did is short the FXE strangles. Uh, universal health care is good for the GDP. Yeah, you'd think, right? I see the OO. How can we expand the view? You right click, you, you use your right button mouse on an image. Well, let's find an image. So if we're, in the, if we're looking at a portfolio, well, not here, obviously. That's uh, <laughs> Anyway, any, any image, you right click on the image, you open it in a new tab. And it opens it up as a full-size image. See, see here's the image, and here's a full-size image. And you just use your right, your opposite mouse button to do that. Health insurance companies are paying the highest fee for any Google click over hundred dollars. Yeah, there you go. And that's what's wrong with the whole thing, okay? Because that, you, yeah, what you're saying is true. They pay a fortune because they make a fortune. Who the hell else makes fifty dollars a pill for something that your doctor requires you to pay? Oh, and I'll tell you the biggest scam that I, I pisses me off. With now that I have kids, I see this game that they play. They give them a prescription of things they have to take all the time. Then they only renew them for like three times. And after the third time, you have to go back to the doctor to get your prescription redone. So the pharmacy won't just give you your prescription to keep going. The doctor, you have to come back and see the doctor. So now you're making four appointments a year. If you're on, if you're on, a, on, an, if you're on a thing that you take every day, you're making four appointments a year to see your doctor just to get the same goddamn pills you've been having the whole time. And uh, so, they rack, so they rack up their four visits. And uh, the uh, pharmacy's in on the game, and the whole thing is like, it's just, they, it's just back and forth. And meanwhile, the stupid rep for the company is going in and telling the doctor, oh, prescribe, you know, prescribe more of these, and we'll, we'll send you to this conference. It's disgusting. I mean, I agree. There's certainly some, some drugs actually help people, but I think that they put people on so many drugs that are not necessary, and people are taking so many pills that they could do without. And nobody oversees it. It's, it's a game. They, uh, on TV... They're advertising, and think about how many ads you see for medical crap on TV. On TV, they're advertising stuff you don't need. They're not hitting you as a target audience. They're advertising, like, you know, I, I, the, the purple things, the next teams, and whatever, all kinds of stuff. And they're saying, oh, well, you better talk to your doctor. If you have this, if you, you know, if you think this or that is wrong with you, go talk to your doctor and ask him why he's not trying this for you. Because once you do that, here's the thing. See, once you complain about something to a doctor, 
they are then obligated to take it seriously and attempt to treat it. So they, they, their job in the advertising is to put these ideas in your head that you might have this, you might have that, or try this, or if you are a little bit have a little bit of heartburn, you should be on pills for the rest of your life. It's like, how about eat less food that's bad for you? <laughs> you know, if you imagine a commercial on TV, if you have heartburn, perhaps eat smaller portions and, and less acidy foods. <laughs> these are foods that are hard to digest. Try to avoid them. Boom, boom, boom. You know, then, then you don't have to take pills for the rest of your life. With, with bad side effects. And obviously not for everybody. Some people have serious problems where they, where they have something wrong with them. They have to take pills. But not everybody does. But there's no reward system to not taking pills. And that's really the biggest difference between European medicine and American medicine. Because in America, everything is geared towards more and more pills. In Europe, they actually reward the doctors. The government rewards the doctors for getting you off of pills. They reward the doctor for getting you to lose weight. They reward the doctor for getting you, know, for getting you to stop smoking. You actually, the doctor actually gets rewarded for making you healthy. That's their incentive program there. Our doctors are rewarded for maintaining sickness. They don't want you to die, but they want you to stay sick. Because as, as, as long as you're sick, you're a cash machine. Health insurance and travel, I think, are the two highest paid clicks. Where we go? How about talk of digital dollars and man cash? No interest in that at all. So the, the, well, obviously, the government's very in favor of it because they want to know where every single penny you spend went so they can tax it. And, and you know what's funny? I won't affect rich people either. Because when you're rich, you can trade a painting for a house. <laughs> you know, try to try to that with somebody you know and see how far you get. If you're a rich person, though, you get a painting appraised for five million dollars. Give the guy two million for the house, and uh, and the and leave the painting in the house. That's how it works. That's how they get out of paying for this. You know, people people do house deals. Rich people do house deals that are that are combined with uh, with company deals. Like they'll make an agreement to do this or do that, or they'll buy something here. You know, like they'll 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 give a contract to a trucking company, and the trucking company guy sells his house along with this at a reasonable price. There's all kinds of games you can play when you've got incredible amounts of money and varied business interests. There are things you can always work out. But for regular people, they if they make money digital. That's it. Basically, everything you do will be tracked. You will be 100%. Every penny you will be taxed on everything that happens, and everything you do will be tracked, monitored, and, and, and cashed. I mean, it's a horrible thing. It's a real shame. So people who want freedom, this is not freedom. Uh, please review SQQ for a new entry. Hedges are killing you. Hedges are supposed to be killing you when the market's going well. Okay, if, you're, if your longs aren't doing fantastically like our longs are in the portfolio and your hedges are killing you, then you've got way too many hedges. Very simple. And if you have too many hedges, you should see it every day. The market, if the market goes up, I don't mean one, I don't mean the one day up, I mean if the market goes up a few percent, like two and a half percent, and you're losing money in your portfolio, probably you're overhedged. Unless you're super bearish, but even you know we're pretty bearish, and, and you know as far as short term we think there's going to be a correction, but um, we're not that bearish. I mean we could be making a lot more money the way we're leveraged in our longs, but we're doing fine. You know we're making consistent good money, and we're losing plenty of money in our hedges. But it's proportional to what we make. It's only it's only a, it's it's less than a third of what we're gaining. It's about a quarter of what we're gaining, in fact. And that's what hedges are supposed to do. And and don't say it's hard to monitor because it's easy to monitor. What's your total portfolio balance from on the day the market goes up one percent? 
<coughs> and if it's negative, you're probably overhedged. And wait for it to go up another percent, now you're negative again. Now you're definitely overhedged. What's the solution? Cut back on your hedges. <laughs> it's not hard. In fact, just Friday, wasn't it Friday? Was it last Friday? When did I write that? Huh, it probably wasn't Friday, because that was Friday after Thanksgiving. So it had to be Friday before that. So let's go back in time to November 18th. Whoa. OPEC deal room is right on schedule. This is interesting. What kind of stuff did I say here? Options expiration day. Boosting oil gold. Everything is priced in dollars. This is how they take advantage of TA people. Uh, ba 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 Okay. <clears throat> futures. That's how we knew to go long on gasoline futures with the 1325 line this morning. Wow, 1325. Where's gasoline now? Let's see. Hmm. I wonder. Gasoline. 148. Holy cow, that's 16 cents. Let me see. Um, that's. $420 per penny times 16 is $6,720 in two weeks. That's pretty good. Okay. What else did I say? Um, okay, 13.25 line. Now, what was my reason? Based on the chart of the dollar and the expectation of a rumor from OPEC, we discussed blah, blah, blah. We've been in and out of RB all week, blah, blah, blah blah, 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 and we talked about Casey also in Casey, well, this is our being here, all right? Uh, then as you can see, we made money, blah, 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 we've been doing the gasoline trades, we like them here. Okay, we knew uh, we'd come, okay, that was into the holiday. Remember, because we've done their free futures, a strong dollar in the UK. Uh, okay, a strong dollar is good for the UK. Wow, that's interesting. It turned out that was true. Um, we were short the Nikkei at 18,000 the EWJ puts. We still have those, and that did not work out at all. But they're March, so we'll see what happens. Um, they, oh, wait. Ah, oh, man, all that is because I was trying to find this trade. Damn it. Was it the Friday before? So that was, that we got totally off track, because that wasn't even my point. So it wasn't that Friday. Maybe it wasn't a Friday. Maybe that's where I'm going wrong. Okay. Nope. All right, I forgot. But anyway, I had a DIA hedge in case the markets went up. Oh, are we there yet? Maybe that was it. Report. Oh, that was a good call. Holy cow. What day was that? That's November 14th. Wow. Report went flying, huh? Okay, it's copy. We like the long September 6th at 151. Topped out at 172 for a gain. And that was that. Okay, so. Now it's back to 265 and we like it again. Now coffee is actually cheaper now. Coffee is, where are you? There it is. 150. Ugh. Really do like it here. If they, you gotta watch this lineup. 150 sales to get out of the trade. But 150 is a good price to be long. I think I have, I think I got about two longs right now. Let me see. Where are my two longs? Trade, active trade, there we go. Ew. Oh, no, that's right, because I have the long, I have longer contract. And I'm in N7, which is July. There you are. Yeah. So down 450. 15575 is my average entry which really isn't very far from where we are now. So don't forget that's not, that's not this contract, that's the July contract that I'm in, because I have no intention to do I'm, I'm really not 
even looking at them unless I don't know what the hell they're doing. So we'll see what happens over time. Meanwhile, still not even back to where we got out of the Russells. Oh, now we are. Okay. This is where I, this is where I gave up on them, 1325. I thought we'd get a little bump up into the close. Oh, the Fed, damn it. Time for the beige book. Hmm. It is two o'clock, right? No, not up yet. Hmm. That's messed up. Oh, come on. All right, let's answer another question. We'll get back to it. All right, SQQQ. Well, might the SQQ we like is the same one, basically. It's, um, do we have, oh, no, wait. I think we have a hedge point here. No, that's not the one I like. Ha ha ha. You know, I, I thought that we adjusted that one already, but I guess we didn't. I, so I thought in the um, in the short term portfolio. No, we didn't adjust it. Damn it! I could have sworn we went to 2018 on SQQQ. Hmm. Well, the March calls are I mean, look, we, we last thing we did was buy uh, back on 915. We bought these March calls for 290. Now they're 230. That's the cost of insurance. You know, that's no big deal. Uh, what I like for SQQQ as a new trade, I don't understand this. I could have sworn we talked about this. Anybody remembers, like, actually changing this? Let me know because I, I could have sworn we did this. Like, I, I was so sure I wanted to do it, I didn't even think about it. Um, SQQQ is at 13. The, uh, the 12, the 2000, uh, the, the January 18 12 are, uh, 320 seems to be the right price right in between here and with last sale. So you can sell these, buy these, sorry, buy these for 320. And, uh, let's say we give them five bucks, okay? The 17s are, they're not $2. Um, see these are 230 and these are 280. They're probably 250. So these are 250. So 320. I mean, look at the, look at the spread. 320. You can buy these for the 12s. You can sell the 17s for 250, and that's net 70 cents on a five dollar spread. There's your hedge. Okay, so for 3500 dollars, you buy 50 for 3500 dollars. And you've got $25,000 of protection. And all you have to do to offset your $3,500 cost is find something that you really want to own and sell $3,500 worth of puts. And then you have free protection for an entire year. Now, understand that if the NASDAQ takes a quick dip and recovers, you will not make any money on the hedge. That's not what it's for. It's for if the NASDAQ goes down and stays down, you'll get $25,000. If the NASDAQ goes down and comes back, you won't get any money. But you know what you have? Your lawns are in good shape. That's what you get. It's insurance. If you don't need the insurance, it expires worthless. But that's how insurance should be. That's why we're not losing money in our portfolio, because we only spend 3500 bucks to buy $25,000 worth of insurance, and we offset the $3,500, so we're not even spending that. And by definition, because we offset with something bullish, if the market does well, we're not losing money, right? Obviously, if the market's going up, then the hedge to our hedge is doing well, and, and, the hedge, and then our hedge doesn't cost us any money. 
That's the point of these things. That's why we do these exercises over and over and over again. Oh, Facebook. Um, damn it. Am I doing something wrong? It's got to be out. Shit. Page. Look. This is where I just was, right? I've never seen it not be up before. All right, news. Beige book on Twitter. It's probably our best chance. Here comes the beige book. China beige book. Oh, there you go. Speaking of foreign countries, that's interesting. Look how easily distracted I am. <laughs> All right, well, not obviously didn't go right to anything. Beige book full text. There you go. Thank you. That's full text? Oh, this is a full text. Wow. I got to get this guy's job. So, a Kindle Lottie boy, <laughs> I don't know who he is. He, um, so, all he does is he writes a paragraph <clears throat> that says what? The Federal Reserve said the economy continued to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, the Beige Book is a compilation of stuff. This document has been prepared. Minutes of the meeting show the Fed. That's talking about the Fed meeting. has nothing to do with the Beige Book at all. Uh, but, 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 but I guess it's considered background. So he's got a background piece. He's written nothing in itself except for this one little paragraph. And he slaps on the text of the Beige Book, which is free, of course. And this is his article. He gets paid, and he gets to go home for that. Okay? And you, know, you guys wonder why we're all getting replaced by machines. This guy put in zero effort. I, I mean, literally, literally wrote a sentence. And that's his job. He added a sentence to the beige book. <laughs> Out of principle, I would replace him with a computer as soon as possible. But anyway, all right, let's get back to this. So 12 days to indicate the economy continues to expand, most regions, blah, blah, blah. Moderate pace, Dallas modest growth, Kansas City slight pace of growth. That's not good. Okay. These three cities, slight pace of growth. Again, when you're market, I don't mind reading that if we're like having a normal market and all that and saying, oh, well, the economy seems okay. This is all time highs. Okay. Atlanta, Chicago, St. Louis, and Dallas, modest growth. Philadelphia, Cleveland, Kansas City. Slight pace of growth. Richmond says mixed. New York says flat. The only people having fun are Boston, San Francisco, which are both tech hubs, and Minneapolis, which is just cold. I'm not sure what they do there. <laughs> and, and even they're saying moderate. Nobody is saying robust. Nobody is saying anything that has anything to do with all-time highs in the stock market. And the biggest city in the world says mixed, flat. Outlooks are positive. People think things are getting better. This is where your market all-time high comes from. Outlooks are positive. People think things are going to be great. America will be great again. Don't forget, most of the people the Fed is talking to are business owners who are probably Republicans. So they are thrilled. Oh, and by the way, when, when, uh, what, wait, Fed, it doesn't say. If you look at the actual base book, it tells you when, they, um, when it was through. So this is probably right up until the election, basically. All right, demand for products was mixed. Strong dollar cited as a headwind. Uh, that's, is that changing? No. Modest to moderate increases in capital. Business service forms rising activities, especially for high tech and information. So high tech and IT doing well. Reports from ground freight carriers were mixed. Port cargo increased. Majority districts were at higher retail prices. We know that inflation. New motor sales declined. Um, 
shifting the men towards youth vehicles. That's interesting. Tourism is mostly positive. Residential, that's interesting with a strong dollar, too, because it's really killing people to come here. Residential real estate activity accrues across most districts. Single-family construction starts were higher in a majority of districts. That's nice. Single-family construction starts. Good for our building, friends. Multifamilies were mixed. Okay, they've been overbuilding multifamilies anyway, so there's nothing wrong with that. Activity in non-residential real estate expanded in many districts. Banking conditions were stable. Some improvement in loan demand. Farmers across districts were generally satisfied with the harvest. It's important to know. However, low commodity prices continue to weigh on farm income. Investment in oil, gas, drilling increased slightly, while reports on coal production were mixed. Tightening the labor market was reported in seven districts with modest employment growth on balance. Districts noted slight upper pressure on oil prices. Uh, it's a blah, blah report. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Okay, so it's a blah, blah report. There's nothing to it. It's not exciting. It's not, and it goes back to the same thing, though. It's not all-time high. Why are we at all-time highs if that's what the report looks like? That is not the report that says the market should be going higher and higher and higher. All right, not enough long. Oh, wait, that's that. Your thoughts on REITs and how to use them. How to use them. My observation is it seems a lot of money coming out of the movie. Yeah, of course. No, REITs, how to use a REIT, don't use a REIT right now. We're in some REITs for long term. We don't give a crap if they get low. If they get low, we'll probably buy more. So in the long-term portfolio, we have um, you know, and, and, and in, in a portfolio, when, you, when you're running a balanced portfolio, okay, you don't expect every stock to do well all the time. We have stocks that do well when interest rates go down. We have stocks that do well when interest rates go up. Okay, so we have REITs. They will go down. We don't care. We don't have them really for the, for the growth. We have them for the, um, for the dividend income. So here's Armour. Here's Carlisle's not really REIT. Um, here's Chimera. Here's uh, Hog Navy's a builder. Nice. They should be doing well. Oh, two bucks. Yay. Ha! Ah, that's our goal. Um, we have a North Star, and we have a Starward. Okay, so we have, some, we have a few REITs in there. Um, and yeah, they'll, they'll pull back a bit, but, but I don't really care because arm, look, here's armor, right? They pay us a dividend every month. We have, we, we bought the stock in July, of, in July 2015, we bought it for 22.72. It's now 22.18. We sold the April 21 puts and calls. So our target is 21, not even 22. So do we care? No. We expect to pull back. We expect to pull back in, in October when we sold these puts and calls. Same thing for Chimera. We sold in June, we sold the December 15 puts and calls, and they're way over our target. Uh, North Star, we, in December of last year, we sold the January 15 puts and calls, and they were right at 15. Perfect. We nailed the target. Oh, no, we didn't even sell the 50. We, we weren't even that confident. We sold the 13 puts. They're right on target. Okay, so they're part of our portfolio. We've been collecting these dividends on them. I think, I think we calculated about 50,000 a year in dividends we get on our dividend section. Um, and we don't really give a crap if they go up or down. As long as they don't go down so drastically, if they go up drastically, we pull it away, and that's the end of it, okay? If they go down drastically, we decide whether or not it's worth doubling down on them. There's only two possibilities for us. Or they, or they stay flat, and we just make a lot of money. Flat actually makes us the most money. Very relaxing. You know, if, if you stop trying to win, you'll be much happier. Because you don't need to win. This is what be the half strategy is all about, okay? Stop trying to be the winner. Be the house, not the gambler. And what does that mean? It means if you go into the house, if you go into my house, and you buy puts from me, and you buy calls from me, you want a big move up or down on your stock. If you come over to my side of the table, what am I doing? I own the stock. 
and I'll sell you puts, and I'll sell you calls. And if the stock goes way up, I'll sell you my stock, and you gave me the money already for my call. And if the stock goes way down, then, then you'll get paid on your puts, and I'll end up buying more stock. So I'll double down at a lower price on the stock that I wanted anyway. I almost can't lose. I, I could lose from a cash perspective, but if you try to – I mean, you know, look, it's like Apple, right? Apple's, what, 110 now? So I sell the $90 puts on Apple. So if I, if, I end up, if I end up getting a signed Apple at $90, that's how you win on your put, right? If I sell you a put, all you can do is make me buy Apple from you for $90. That's, that's what your right becomes when, you, when I sell you a put. I still keep your money, but you can make me buy Apple for $90. So if I sell you a put on Apple at $90, and it's $110 now, and I, I own Apple now at $110, <clears throat> what's going to happen to me? Well, either your puts expire worthless because Apple went up and I just keep your money and you seem like an idiot to me because you gave me your money for nothing, or Apple goes down to 90 and I buy Apple from you for 90 and I keep your money. So maybe I net in for 85 and now my average on Apple goes from 110 to um, 97.50. So sitting right here right now, do I want to own more Apple at 97.50? Yes, of course I do. So therefore, I have no problem taking your money and promising to buy Apple for, you know, I have no problem taking 250 from you in exchange for promising to buy Apple for 80, for, um, I'm sorry, five, it's five bucks. So I take five dollars from you in exchange for promising to um, buy Apple from you for 90 bucks. That's, that's not a hard thing for me to decide. I want to buy Apple for 90 bucks. Now, when it actually happens, and this is where you guys will fall apart, when Apple actually does go down to 80, 80, and you're forced to buy Apple for 85, you freak out because you lost five bucks, and and five bucks is 100 percent of the of the option price. So you lost 100 percent on your short puts. So that's not the way I look at it. I look at it and say, I'm buying more Apple. I'm buying Apple for 85 dollars. It's an 80. So I'm buying it for five dollars over the price because I took a chance and promised it. But you know what else I did? I sold calls. Because I'm the house. I didn't bet. I sold some that I called. I sold some that I put. So I actually collected $10, not $5. So I win if it goes up, obviously. If it goes down, I just get more of the stock that I like anyway. And if I want to get out with a small loss, I get out with a small loss. Or if it's flat, I win on both sides. So I sell puts and calls and I keep the stock and I go and do it again. So I'm winning, and I'm winning, and I'm winning constantly over and over again on all of my stocks. And it's not a lot, and I'm never going to go, ha-ha, I made triple my money on Apple, because it won't happen. I'll get called away with a 10 15% gain. But you know what? I will constantly, constantly make 10 or 15% every single year, almost never losing money. And after 20 years, I will do better than somebody trying to double up on the stock. It is better to constantly make 10% consistently. You will have three times your money. Okay, it doubles every seven years. 10% compound that you double every seven years. If you consistently make 10%, you will, you will have three times the money in 20 years. Okay, how many stocks are you going to pick where you take a chance hoping they're going to go up where you're going to have three times your money in 20 years? And, and, and you may say, oh, well, what about if there's suddenly inflation? Or what about if the market suddenly goes up? If the market suddenly goes up, I'm not an idiot. I'll get a little more aggressive, but I don't have to be. And I can afford to be a little more aggressive. And I can take, you know, like, like, like we all with Apple. Because what's our Apple position? We only sold 10 calls. Is that right here? Yeah, we are aggressive because we have 40 longs and we only sold 10 calls. That's pretty aggressive. Okay, other stocks we can sell any calls. Here, you know, this one's half covered. Cliff is half covered. Um, this one is uh, half covered, DBA. 
most of these are uncovered. See, this is the thing. We're pretty aggressively long in the long-term portfolio. Probably going to want to sell more calls in back. Um, that this one with one third covered on LL, then, you know, which is uh, well, these are silly. Oh, these, oh, these are going to expire worthless. They're actually not covered. These are going to expire worthless. Um, this one, you know, so so wow. We really are. We don't have a lot of coverage. We're going to have to do a lot of call selling, I think, in the long-term portfolio. So now I'm looking at this and saying, wow, we are pretty bullish. Um, <laughs> but the point is, you know, this is what being the house is, though. I don't give a crap whether it goes up or down. I'm selling premium constantly. I'm constantly making a couple of percent a month, and it adds up to 10, 20 percent a year constantly, year after year after year. And by the way, in the long-term portfolio, it's not like we're slacking. We made 130 percent in three years. So it's not like we're not. It's not like we're really only making that. If everything goes perfectly, like it has been basically, just straight up for three years, then we make more like 40 percent instead of 20 percent. Our goal is 20 percent, but we're making 40 percent, or or probably like 30 percent compounded is where this is. So. You know, look, after, so we're making great money, but we don't have to take big chances to do it. This is a long-term portfolio. We don't put any trades in this portfolio where the time frame is more than six months. I mean, not, not including some short calls we sell or something like that. But there's no trades in here that have less than a six-month time frame. So all these long-term one-year trade, two-year trades in just three years have made 130% rolling themselves over. And the stress level on this thing is, is practically zero. That's how you make money. Short-term trading is gambling. This is wealth building. If you want to get rich, learn to do long-term strategies, well-edged, long-term plays where you sell premium, don't buy it. Very simple. And that's why we've been running this portfolio for three years. So I run it for one year, we make 20%. Next year, I run it, we make 40%. Never, nobody's impressed, okay? I want, I want to show people what happens when you run this for five years. We will be at 200% two years from now. So if you want to make 70%, just take all these trades, and they'll be up 70% in two years. Is that enough? Do you want to make 35% a year? I don't know. I don't know how exciting that is to people. I, I like it, though. I mean, especially for the bulk of your money, for the larger portion of your money, where we started with 500000 here. The other portfolios were 100000 This is our main portfolio. We started $500,000, and now we're up to $1.15 million. And we will be at $2 million in two years, unless there's a huge market correction we're not expecting. Simple, simple strategy, selling. We sell puts to initiate a position. When we get a position, we start selling calls against it. We sell some puts against it. We collect our dividends on the dividend-paying stocks, and we sell short-term calls along the way, and it all adds up very, very quickly. But, but, but when I say very, very quickly, I mean quarter by quarter by quarter. There's no day, there's no day trading here. We don't go in and out. Once a month, we look at this portfolio and make a couple of changes, and we're done. It's not exciting. The only exciting thing is to actually have a lot of money when you retire. That's the exciting part. It's not day-to-day -day exciting. It's incredibly boring day-to-day. -day. That's why we do all this other stuff, because frankly, this is boring. But this portfolio and the butterfly portfolio, which is up even more than this one, 221% on the butterfly portfolio. Same thing started with 100,000 bucks. And now it is 321. So it's tripled. Same thing. Buy long term, sell short term, sell short term. People who want quarterly options, monthly options, we sell it to them because they are suckers. Because they think they know what the market's going to do, and it turns out nine out of ten times they're wrong. And you know that statistic, right? You know that 80% of all options expire worthless. So why not sell them? 
if you know that's true, why do you want to play the side where you have to be right, where you have 20% chance of being right? I'll take the side I'm going to be right 80% of the time. Because I'll be right 80% of the time over and over and over again, and that's my income. Oh, now he posted the base book. I'm going to have to let him. No, something wrong here. Weird. Anyway, all right, that's all right. Wasn't exciting anyway. Oh, do they have any market reaction? Probably not. Or maybe lower. Wow, lower. Wow. Woo hoo. Look at that. Damn it. And I, and I let go of my wrestles. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, that's interesting. How's the dollar? All right. So, it, okay. So everybody's falling. I missed all these guys, but Nikkei didn't fall yet. So let's do that. So let's short some Nikkei's. Um, see, very, very simple. I look to see who didn't fall yet. And yes, the Nikkei is on different sequence. But if all the indexes are going down and the dollar is going down, then Nikkei's got a very good chance to fall. So let's go I'm short one. All right, we'll see how that goes. So we're at 18.610, we shorted two units. So not a good finish for the last day of the month, is it? All right, so one way, I want to be clear on that. So you understand, I looked, I would, because I was yapping to you guys and wasn't trading, even though we knew the beige book wasn't, even though I said the beige book didn't justify this market, okay, apparently other people agreed with me, and we're selling off more and breaking down the new lows. And here's that 1320 line we were looking for on the Russell, right? See? And what's 1320 on the Russell? There it is, right there, 1320. Okay, that's, that's two years ago we, we called that number. Very, very simple. So anyway, I'm sorry, it's in the middle of talking about it. So I missed everything, but the Nikkei. The Nikkei is still off in space. Why is that? Because the Nikkei is closed, because nobody's trading it. These guys are all sleeping. All these U.S. investors are scrambling to sell off the stuff they have in America. They're not worried about their ja Japanese holdings and things like that. So it's a great chance to swoop in and short the Nikkei. And if we're lucky, see how these guys all fell to the bottom of their range? Look at the Nikkei's range. Their bottom is way the frick down there. Okay, if, if this is 400 points. That's a $2,000 move there. I'll be happy to make 1000 at 18.4. At 18.4, we make 1000 per contract. They just picked up two short contracts. And I'll watch. If the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the NASDAQ holds here, if the Dow starts going back up, if the S&P goes up, if the Russell bounces right back off uh, 1320, I'll get out of my NK short. If the dollar comes back, I'll get out of my Nikkei short. But otherwise, I think it's good, especially if these guys fall lower. And I'm less likely to get burned on the Nikkei by a big move up because the Nikkei's already stopped up here when these guys were way up here. So unless I really miss something, I'll be able to get out of the Nikkei with a very small loss. So low possibility of loss, high possibility of reward, that's what makes a good trade. Yeah, India really, <laughs> India really cracked down on on cash. That was nasty, and that we'll see what the repercussions are now. The interest, but if it works out, you know, if it's a good experiment for them, you'll see all the government start to move to ban cash. There's really no reason for it. It is, it is kind of pointless at this stage, but I just kind of, I just object to the concept of the government watching every single thing you do. Are we taking longs off the table yet? Well, I'm certainly going to be covering the longs. I don't know about taking them off the table, but maybe covering it. Look, I keep wanting to go to cash. I mean, it's always been a bad idea. Every time I want to go to cash, I'm glad I didn't three months later. So we'll see. 
But yeah, it's gave the crap out of me. The Trump's coming in January 20th, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So if nothing else, we're certainly going to be well hedged going into the holidays. Well, that says that's exactly how much I lost when I stopped out of the RB at 128. Oh, that sucks, man. <laughs> and then you watch you go to 145 without any contracts. That is not fun. Oh, wait till Trump takes over. Yeah, everything will be on Twitter. That'll be that'll be a rule. <laughs> All government reports have to be uh, 140 characters or less. Economy good. <laughs> Economy good. America strong. <laughs> that is Russia, right? That's that essentially is Russian, right there. Okay, so index is moving south. Can you go over where and how you take profits? And where is the bounce line on TF for the five percent rule? Okay, let's do that. That's fun. Because that's kind of the same question that Naomi has. Um, bup, 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 bup. All right. So let's look at the Russell, and let's look at that time frame. We'll call it hours is a good time frame. So, well, first of all, we know 1320 is significant support, significant support at 1320. It's at 10% line. If we go back further, day chart, 1320, it has not really been tested much, though. So it's a 10% line. So although it's significant support, because it's a 10% plus line, it has never been tested from above. Never. 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 See, never got tested really. Well, I guess you pull out that. But anyway, but other than when it broke up over in, the, in these two days, it never really had a proper test at 1320. So if it goes right back through, that means this whole move to 1320 is going to be considered a spike up, which, frankly, in the grand scheme of things, looks like this. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So when you go, when you zoom out, when you actually look at it, it'll be in the grand scheme of a couple of years. This will suddenly look like nothing. It'll look like this does. It'll look like these do. It'll look like a, a move. In fact, it'll look exactly like this does. It'll look like a move up and a move back down, and this all canceled out. And then you'll just say, well, we consolidated along 1100. That's a summary of this. Two years worth of movement summarizes to we consolidated at the 1100 line. Then we went on to 12, then to 13. But we consolidated along 1,100 for two years. Okay? That's all this is. It means nothing. And you need to have that perspective. You need to look at those longer term charts to get an idea of where you really are. If you look at the hourly chart, you're like, ooh, look at 1320. It's not really a strong support line. If it holds, it indicates that we're still bullish. But my prediction then, since I don't believe we're still bullish, is that it won't hold, which means I don't expect much of a bounce. Now, the bounce is from 1345 to 1320. is a 25-point drop. So the bounces are five points for a weak bounce to 25, and 10 points would be a strong bounce, 20% of the drop. So 10 points would be a strong bounce, 40% of the drop to 1330. I do not believe we're going back over 1330. If my premise is correct and the markets are weak, we will fail either at 1325 or 1330. And when we fail, we will then fail 1320, even if we bounce. If we don't bounce and we fail, then immediately it's bearish. But assuming we bounce at 1320, Assuming that bounces, then I say we will fail 1325 or 1330. We will come back to 1320. We will fail the test at 1330, and we will continue back down for a proper correction. Now, what would that proper correction be? Well, now we go back to the big chart. And the move up 1260 to 1320 is what was predicted. So we look at this now in the bigger picture. And do we confirm that? Yes, we do. 1260, see this was the highs? 1260, we had a test, fail, retrace, test, fail, retrace, double retrace, even further back. Then a test and success, punched up to 1320, passed it, but it doesn't matter if we passed it, we quickly go back. And now, if 1320 fails, though, 
what are we really looking at? It was from 1260 to 1320 is 60 points. All right, so 60 points means we have another 12 point retrace below 1320. And let's, well, I don't want to call it anything. It really is, uh, so we'll end up at like 1305, uh, 1308. And below 1308, the next one will be 12, whatever, um, 1297. So on this short run, this is a short term retrace, the next significant numbers are going to be um, 1308 and then uh, 96, 1296. That's the short term things we'd be looking for this week. Once you go past this week, though, we're really looking at the bigger, bigger picture, which is from 1200 to 1320, which is 120. And then you're looking at 25 point retraces. I know it's 24, really, but 4 25. And then you'd be looking at 1295 and uh, 1270. So those are your numbers going down 1308, 1296, and 1295, which means 1295 obviously would be the, the priority line. And 1295 failing is going to take you all the way back down to 1270 easily. So how's the oil doing? I can look over here. Oh, 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 really? I didn't know that. That is a shorting opportunity. Ow, damn it, nobody told me. God damn it. <laughs> oh, that's right where I wanted to short it. I'm so pissed. And 150 on gasoline. Oh, another great lot. <laughs> and saying that all day, I wanted to short at 150. Oh well. All right, these are not chaseable. I, I, I don't want to mess around with these. But, but you know, it's bullshit. It's too much. Based on what we know about OPEC and based on what we see, it's just too much. All right, watch this 2200 line. If that fails, everybody's going down. All right, what do we got? Oh, last few questions we'll do. Angry Russian acting. Yeah, I'm really good with my Russian. <laughs> I'm good with my Russian. Hang out with the boys in Brooklyn. Uh, would you sell monthly or quarterly short-term calls in UNG as income to support long-term puts? No, because um, well, not many anyway. Because uh, it depends. You know, look, it always depends where you are in your channel. You don't just sell because you're selling. You sell because you're low in your, you know, you sell when you're up in your channel. So here, we're not really up in the channel. You know, forget this. This, this was silly. I think it was silly anyway. So this was silly. I think the 200 DMA is a fair thing to expect to hold. We're right in the middle here at the 50. We probably will go up to 950. At 950, absolutely I want to sell. When look at the, you know, see this is like consolidating, it's trying to move up here. Volume's increasing as it's going. Look at the big spike in volume. Volume, 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 up, up, up. It's people buying this stuff. It's not, it's not a time I want to be selling. You just broke over the 50 day moving average. If you fail the 50 day moving average, maybe a protective sell. But here, I don't want to sell. I want to let, get, let it run. You, you can't do these things just because you think you should. You know, you, just because you say, oh, I like to sell puts. It's like the long-term portfolio, right? We look at it all the time, and I keep ending my statements with like, oh, God, I like all these positions. I don't want to sell anything. I try to sell. I, in fact, I ate here. Where's that? Hmm. I don't know where that review was. Oh, well, we'll go back to this here. We'll go back to this review. This is why I write these reviews. I wish you guys would actually read them. You skip, you skip ahead to the positions. But, um, okay. So, are we still too bullish? So the combined number here is 157249. That's the long-term and short-term portfolios. That's our paired portfolio. The short-term portfolio protects the long-term portfolio. So now the long-term by itself is almost uh, 112, right? 1157. Plus, ah. 
478. That's going to be a big number. 478. 1635. Okay, so um, when I was having my angst, 1572. So, well, you can see what it is. I mean, so minus 1572, $63,000. So, <clears throat> since um, September 3rd, so in two months, we've made $63,000. Which is 10% of our of our initial 600,000 we put into these things, and and in fact we had made 52,000 since July at that point. So we're very consistent in our portfolios. And why are we consistent? Because we're balanced. You're supposed to be consistent when you're balanced. Okay. So I know if the market goes up, I'm going to make a 5% a month, 4% a month. I know that's pretty steady for my gains. And that means when the market goes up, I expect to be making money, not losing. If I'm losing money, I'm doing something wrong. The market goes up, I make money. When the market goes down, I should lose money, but not too much. That's how it should work. All right, so, and I said, yeah, we were wrong so far in a heavily short-term portfolio. And this short-term portfolio keeps losing money. That's okay. I don't mind that my short-term portfolio keeps making, losing money because my long-term portfolio makes more money. I even right here, you day traders, I implore you to read these reviews and look over the positions and consider that day trading is not the best way to play the market. All right, so here we go, blah, 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 blah. Now, I want to see what my conclusion was after doing well. I want to see what my long-term portfolio was. Let's see. Is this my long-term portfolio? Yes, LTP. All right, let's see what I said. Ah. It's stuck on that rolly thing. All right. So we have 1085 at the time. So we've made 100,000 here. So, so I said, what did we make? 60 something thousand, right? So we made 100,000 in this portfolio, and obviously we lost like 30 or 40,000 in the short term portfolio. That's fine. That's what they're supposed to do. Frankly, look, I'm so consistent, right? Can I even sit here? If we're making more than 5% a month, we're probably too bullish. And we're mostly in cash, so I felt good. I feel good about that. I don't mind where we are because we're mostly in cash, so we don't really care if the market sells off, okay? We have plenty of cash to go shopping. All right. The LTP is not a standalone. We began it with 500,000. We had 100,000 short term portfolio, which protects the long term portfolio, and that's working, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now, <clears throat> so here we are. I looked at the, these are our short puts. Looked at the upside amounts for those. Um, we looked at our index plays, our dividend plays, sorry. And then we, these are all of our weird plays. We had, we had nothing to do. Look at what we said, on track, on track, on track. Everything looked good. There was nothing to change. There's like three, four things that we changed here. And here I am. Damn, every time I go over this portfolio with the intent of cashing things out, I can't because our positions are too good. Okay? I said, of course, these are the ones that survived the summer purge when we did dump 40% of, of the winners, and now our losers. These are, these are, that's what these are. These are the losers. When we purged the portfolio in the summer, we cashed out our winners and left all the underperforming stocks. Almost all of them, anyway. And what were they? They were mostly material stocks and energy stocks, things like that, that were not performing well. Because that's what we expected to do well later in the year. Our REITs were doing terribly at the time. We kept all our REITs. We doubled down on our REITs, in fact. And they, and they came back with a vengeance. Because we know that things cycle through. So now it's a little different because now we're looking, now we're going to look carefully at what we have left. But you see what's happening? I mean, I, wrote, I write this stuff out the exact way we're following strategy. All the stuff I'm telling you is here in writing two months ago. Tell me exactly what we're doing. Um, I said, "Oh well, we're stuck with them. I guess it looks like if things go well, we'll book another. We'll we'll book another two hundred thousand from our spread section. So I was adding up how much money we'd make off of everything if things keep going well. And we're doing exactly what I said we'd do. Exactly on the track I said we'd be on. Everything is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. 
Um, so you can see the money making power of the portfolio accelerates as time goes on. The mature positions make better money. Uh, we're just waiting for the sole premiums to grind down on us, and the new stuff we add is gravy. Um, and best of all, we can do is with 80% of our cash is on the side, using just 14% of our margin. A crash would be fantastic, but if it doesn't come, we have to settle for making 48%. We have, a, we have a plan. And in this portfolio, I review every dollar we're going to make. Every position, everyone says how much we're going to make on the, you know, if we leave it alone and it goes well. So we know exactly what to expect. We expect to make 4% a month, and we are making exactly 4% a month. Okay? This, this is not just, if all you're doing is looking at the portfolio, you're doing this all wrong. So this is your teaching, this is a teaching section. And I talk about the strategy, I talk about how we lay out the plays, why we're in each play, what we're looking for in each play. Okay? I mean, if you want to learn this stuff, learn it. Take the time to really look at these things. Don't just like skim to the good part. Want to add a new edge on SQQ, how to select the strike. Didn't we just talk about 2018, 12, 17, bull call spread for 70 cents net? Forget March, so. Okay, you're in 2018 now. You don't want the decay. You don't want to, you don't want to jump into something that's going to evaporate on you right away. The, the spread is fine. The 1217 spread, if SQQ, if, if the NASDAQ is lower in the end of the year, that will make money. If the NASDAQ is not lower, you'll lose your 3200 bucks, assuming you have 350 of them. Uh, but it's a $25,000 protection for your portfolio for 3200 bucks. What's not to like? It will not pay you off. If the market dips tomorrow, that, that spread will barely change. It's only if it goes down and stays down. But if it doesn't go down and stay down, and you intend to stick with your long-term positions no matter what, then that's fine. That means your long-term positions came back. What, what, what's this? You and you, let's say you had six to ten bull call spread and send ten puts as an example. Well, first of all, why do you sell ten puts if you only have six to ten? All right. um, no, I'm, I'm saying though, you sell in a channel. When something's at the top of a channel, when you think there's a good reason to go short, that's when you sell. If, if it makes you feel better, sell a couple. If you're worried, sell two, sell three. Don't sell none if you're worried. But, but, don't, but I wouldn't fully cover when you're in the middle of a channel unless you have a reason to be bearish. And if you have a reason to be bearish, you should rethink your whole position. Okay? If you don't, if you don't believe in a position, don't, don't stick with it by selling calls. Think about getting out. Want to add a new hedge? How to select the strike? Okay, we talked about that already. I'm sorry. Let's, let's go back. Um, when will we harvest profits on the OOP loans? Well, we, I mean, we're making profit. If we, like, we want to convert it, cash it out. I'm not adverse to that, frankly. Um, we'll look it over. The same as a long-term portfolio. It's like I, I, the, the higher the market is, the less I trust it. So we'll see what happens. If you have time, can you explain how you sell monthly, quarterly calls on a position like Apple and how you determine when you should? Uh, again, it's the same thing. It's a channel. Oh, wrong one. <clears throat> By the way, we're doing a Las Vegas seminar. Um, if you guys are interested, if you can't contact Meyer at Dell Stock World, if you're not a PSW member, um, it's February, I don't know, 11th maybe? Um, I think it's the 11th. Um, around that weekend, anyway. Um, it's going to be a two-day seminar in Vegas. We've done these before. It's really cool. And uh, uh, it's live. It's basically we do this stuff except we do it for two days. And we talk about the markets. We have a live trading day. It's Sunday we talk about the markets like I'm doing now go over stuff, strategy, so on and so forth. And then on Monday, we live trade all day Monday. So it's a, it's a good session. We do a lot of good stuff, educational, and uh, also a lot of fun <laughs> because we all get together and have a great time. Um, that is Vegas on, I believe, February. Oh, that was the wrong thing to touch.
There we go. There. So Saturday night, we would be having a dinner, and we have a poker tournament usually. Sunday is the, is the first day of the webinar, usually, I mean the seminar, usually from um, about 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock. And then Monday, unfortunately, since it's Vegas, though, it's 6.30, the market opens, and from 6.30 until 1 p.m., we are live doing uh, trading. Like right there, whatever's happening, we'll be doing trading, we'll talk about trading, we'll talk about strategy, we'll go over like really good stocks to buy, all kinds of cool stuff. <clears throat> so if you're interested, contact Greg, which is uh, Greg at Phil Stock World, okay, and ask him. Otherwise, uh, there's Maya. If you're in Phil Stock World, just go to the chat room and talk to Maya. He's uh, handling that part. M-A-Y-A, that is. So that's a good commercial. We should make sure we do that. Um, should we bring our staff to Vegas? Well, we don't go to any strip clubs last night. <laughs> it's up to you. I don't bring mine. Um, <laughs> for me, believe me, it's for me, it's a nice peaceful week. I, I, I usually go out on Wednesday for the seminar. Um, I go out like Wednesday and I spend a week in Vegas. Um, I don't leave two, I don't leave Monday because I don't want to deal with it afterwards to get back. So I usually leave like Tuesday or something like that. So for me, it's a nice time to take a week by myself, no wife, no kids, no nothing. It's one of my favorite weeks of the year, actually. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay. Can a member here please post how they open up their portfolios and seeking alpha full view, please, if they can share here. Uh, again, just right click on the on the image and then open it up in a new window or whatever. I thought Monday was a non trade day. What Monday are we talking about? No, that's not true. There's very, very few stock market holidays and that's not one of them. All right. Well, that was uh, great, and let's see where we are as far as the portfolio, as far as the uh, indexes. All right. So we are we bouncing right off that line, off the 2200 line, which is what we thought. Which means we're bouncing off 1320, which is what we thought. And now the question is, do we have strong bounces or weak bounces? All right. Now the Nikkei, since we're bouncing, and the Nikkei is right at 18.6, how about I just cash that, and we'll see what happens on the bounce. I only bought it because I thought we might fall through. We didn't fall through, so there's no reason to be long, is there? Oh, what is that? Seriously, zero? Huh. Okay, I'm short. i got to buy to close. Nope, better get out of it. What's going on? Oh, so let me should be there. Let's see if it even fills. So if I can get out here, I'm zero. If I have to get out here, it's going to cost me um, twenty-five bucks. So obviously, I'd much rather get out here. So I'm keeping my eye on this. But these are bouncing pretty much, so I don't want to get caught. So I, don't, I think I've got one contract offered for sale there, but it's not getting a bite. I do like the fact there's 30 people here and three here, though. So hopefully we'll drop a little. There we go. All right, now I can get out of the other one. Boom, gone. There you go, so nothing. All right, so in other words, I played because if we broke through here, I wanted to be short something, and the Nikkei would have further fall. But now that we're bouncing, I'm going to look to play whoever bounces the most. I'll look to probably play, especially I'd love to play the Russell if we get back to 13.30. But like I said, I don't think we will because we're looking for five-point bounces. So 25 might fail, but if 13.30 fails, that's going to be an exciting short again. All right, so let's wrap it up. Fantastic. Let's get back to the uh, chat room and see what happens, all right? Thanks a lot for coming, everybody. We'll talk again next week. Do I think 401k money comes in December 1st in the month? Well, it always comes in. It's just a question of how much. But I, I think the surge is over. I think that we're going to be getting back to a little bit more normal. All right, guys. Have a lovely day. I'll talk to you all next week, and I'll see the rest of you in the chat room. All right? Take care.